Okay, and we are live. I'm with Brad. How are you today, my friend? Excellent. Got my morning coffee going. We're, Cheers we're, to that one. We're at our uh, bright and early. Yeah. Oh, how do you get your coffee done? We recently got like this Nespresso device thingy. That's what I have. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There you go. It's, it's awesome. Mm. This yeah. episode is brought to you by, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Caffeine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, man. So uh, I know we've been trying to make this happen now for, I don't know, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, whatever it is. Uh, couple so really months. A couple months, a <laughs> couple of years, who knows? But we've, we've, we've known of each other. We've known, I think we maybe conversed a handful of times, but, you know, I've obviously been aware of the Brad for quite some time you're you were, we're somewhat i guess not neighbors but you know we live in the same um general geography right yeah uh, are you are you in toronto or are you on the outskirts? no i'm about i'm about two two and a half hours outside of toronto i'm halfway between detroit and toronto oh so cool the pollution clouds come at me from both sides beautiful love it uh yeah so so i, I usually like to start with where did we first meet and i don't even remember was it at one i of the remember Bitcoin events? oh you do yeah, okay. it was. Oh, hold on i'm gonna shut my door okay 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 i got it mm. um so that was some sort of special effect i like that you like disappeared this way and came up okay anyways continue. oh well i don't didn't notice it's um good, good. so we, we met at uh inside bitcoins no it was it was the the one that they, they do it in miami um what's it called oh, again? bitcoin wait i want to call it bitcoin miami but no it's yeah uh, btc miami is what we always just the guy with the it, glasses mo mo, mo yeah know, that's, mo all I know. that's all i know about it yeah yeah, yeah, so yeah i had heard about uno coin and somehow i had heard that the founder was from toronto hmm. and then um your name is so memorable that <laughs> when I saw it, it just linked. I was like, oh, my God, that's the guy that is from UnoCoin. And <laughs> I was trying to network with local people because I was kind of like in the shadows and didn't want to be popular or, or sorry, public um, about Bitcoin stuff for years. But then mm -hmm. I started to just want to network and evangelize and stuff publicly. So I tried to connect with local Bitcoin people and you were one of them. We met in Miami and which uh, year was that one? Cause I think I've attended twice now. I think it was 2014 or 15. Holy or shit. Okay. So that long ago, that's, that's pretty crazy. So, okay. That's, that's a good start. Uh, I, that was actually quite a, a memorable conference. That was one of the more uh, interesting ones, if you will. Yeah, that was the BTC <laughs> to the moon where they had somebody had spray painted like BTC to the moon all over the sidewalks. And there's a crazy, uh, energy around the price at the time was going up and it was kind of the first mainstream mass adoption wave so it was did lots you of go this year did you go this no, year no no okay yeah yeah because i was wondering because it was pr prior to this whole lockdown thing right so i wonder if mo had it this year he did didn't i think he? he did yeah interesting interesting anyways okay so so as i was telling you earlier or maybe i did tell you i don't think i even told you but what i'm trying to do with this i don't even know what to call it this whatever this is bitcoin stories is I'm trying to not necessarily, I mean, if you want to talk about all time highs, I'm down with that. But the goal is more to capture like evergreen uh, content around people's stories around pre-Bitcoin and post-Bitcoin. So I treat the learning of Bitcoin as a bit of a singularity uh, event in our lives. And mm. I like, I love to learn about kind of people's lenses coming into Bitcoin. And, and some people start with like their first job. Some people start with their parents. Some people start with, you know, whatever. I don't care, right? Wherever you want to start, you can start. Um, <laughs> but I'd love to learn uh, a little bit about like Brad before learning about Bitcoin. And then after learning about this industry, whatever it is, um, blockchain, whatever you want to call it. And then kind of how that impacted your, the arc of, I guess, your, your worldview. Uh, yeah, I guess that's, let's start there. That would be a, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I grew up on the east coast of Canada in Cape Breton, which is mm -hmm. like a high unemployment rate area. It's seasonal jobs, like it, it's it's industries that come and go. It, it was like coal mining in you know turn of the century until like the twenties or something, and then it was like the steel plant was employing everybody, and there was a, a lot of steel produced during the war effort, and then the steel plant polluted the earth and kind of like caused a bunch of havoc and chaos and they closed it down and then it was like fishing was really big and um the problem with with where i grew up was like everybody kind of grew up with this mentality of like being reliant on the government for those seasonal times when you're not working 
then you go on EI. So employment insurance, um, what I don't know what they call it in the States, it's UI, I guess, but whatever it is, you go on the, you go on the government check for, for half the year, you get your hours or you work a job. And then it kind of like generation after generation, it just felt like the East coast was like such an amazing place to grow up. It was like full of art and creativity and comedy and fun and music and talent. Everybody was like, had a side hustle or everybody knew how to play an instrument or was working on a play or a book or something really interesting. Like the skate culture is huge there, skateboarding, hacky sack, like all kinds of alternative cultures, really popular there. But mm. in terms of money, Mm. People, people generally don't strive to achieve more money, you know, like I wasn't brought up with, with the good foundational knowledge about like investing and saving and um, owning things versus renting things and stuff mm. like that. So I had no clue about money. We grew up poor. I was, you know, the first person in my family from, I don't know how long to ever like leave the Island to go to college. Um, it was it was a good upbringing. Like my parents split up when I was young, but even still, it was like, we didn't have any money, but nobody cared about that. It's not like everybody was focused on not having money. It was just like, you didn't have money and that's okay. Money was just something you didn't have. And um, you kind of were reliant on the government and, you know, anybody that wanted to start a business or do something cool, you, your first mindset, first thing you go to there is like, okay, how do I get a grant from the government to do this? Like, how is mm. the government going to fund me to do this project or whatever? Mm. So that was my foundational upbringing in, in like growing up on the East coast, but also at the same time, it bred this really um, kind of an entrepreneurial culture where people were always doing things, always doing side hustles, whether they were selling drugs or like delivering bread door to door or like mm. I, when I was like five or six, I, I was, I was selling apple juice door to door in my because i grew up in like we called it the chicken coops it was like the government housing where the people on welfare go it's like all these like government buildings and i would go door to door and sell apple juice from my container from the fridge like 10 cents a cup thinking that that was actually something someone would want to buy and it was because my mom was always trying to do hustles and my dad was a, you know he had his own business my grandfather was a milkman so it's just a, an interesting um foundation about how to think about money or how not to think about money that took me a long time to unprogram that you know to learn about what is money and being self uh, being independent and um, self-employed even or just to think about not having to rely on anybody else but yourself and how to use the banks and how to use the government in ways that it wasn't like you're reliant on them so, so when did that first, I guess, spark of, of you know, that question mark uh, come into your head where you were like, wait, maybe there's something to this thing called money, uh, like a bit more than maybe I've been led to believe. You know, it was probably when I was, I was, my, my mom actually, for all the kind of like odd upbringing um, that I had, like I moved around to like seven or eight different schools and I never had any like close friends growing up because I didn't stay in a place long enough to make any friends, close friends. But my mom kind of got obsessed with um, trying to make money. And one of the things was, was actually like, I was interested in magic. I got this magic kit. And so my mom was like making us practice this magic show thing for my birthday party. And then I did a, I did the entertainment for my ninth birthday party as a magician. And my mom paid me like 50 bucks. <laughs> so I was like, Oh, I can make some money doing this stuff. So I started to get a little bit into it. I'm like, okay, I want to learn how to juggle and let's do, let's do this at my friend's birthday parties and stuff. And so my mom though, like took that and like turned it into like a real business. So she advertised it all over the place where we'd go and do <laughs> kids entertaining kids was the thing it was basically like child magician slave labor <laughs> for, for like until <laughs> until i got old enough to realize like wait a second i have a choice i don't have to do this anymore it's kind of embarrassing <laughs> like growing up being on the cable news channel doing these uh, like really oh wow magic. so it got pretty big i mean for the local <laughs> area yeah people knew people yeah, knew yeah, who yeah. i was but not in a way that i was excited about because <laughs> we weren't that good like we kind of sucked okay. <laughs> yeah 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 
but still, but still, I mean, magic is an art. I mean, it's an art form. Hey, did you, by the way, sorry, did you hear about Jesse's new book? I think Jesse, I saw you retweet it. The ma- what is it called? Oh, Mad Jesse magic Burger, Internet. I think his name is? Yeah, Magic yeah, Internet. Yeah, money. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I asked because my podcast is called Magic Internet Money, and I was surprised I got that name. Oh. And I PM'd him, and I was like, hey, man, like, I might be rebranding my podcast. If you Do you want to take the podcast name? I'll, I'll give it to you if you want. And he's like, no, no, I don't plan on doing a podcast. You can keep it. So. I, I was willing to give up the name for him, but he doesn't want it. So I'm, I'll just keep rolling with it then. Yeah, yeah. No, I just, it, it just popped in my mind because you're talking about magic. But let's, let's go back to your story. So, so okay, so you're you're doing magic tricks. You're like, okay, I don't know if this is really okay. the way. But I and made a bunch what? of money as a kid. Like, I remember I remember um, making like 100 bucks in a weekend. And this was in the 90s or, the yeah, late 90s, right? 96, 97, something like that. 95 even actually I was doing it young um, 10 11 years old and I would save up my money to buy everybody Christmas presents that's what I would do like I would just save hundreds of dollars and I'd have more money than my parents would because everybody was like paying all their bills and didn't have any savings so <laughs> at the end of the year I was just so excited that I could use my money that I earned all year doing um, practicing magic and and like being doing clown shows and all this stuff to then go buy everybody Christmas presents. I thought it was awesome. So that was one of the most exciting things for me was as a kid, even though things were kind of shitty in some ways, I had money and like for a kid and I I learned the value of, of earning money that you could provide for others and you could do things that could make you feel good. Um, and not just by getting an allowance or whatever, but actually working for it. So you know, as I got older and kind of reflected on it, I kind of used to always think like, oh, my mom just kind of ruined my childhood by making me practice magic all the time and forcing me to do slave labor and all this stuff. But as I got into Bitcoin more and started to learn more about entrepreneurial um, mindset and things like that, I realized that both my mom and my dad and my grandfather even though I grew up in this poor area, they all had positive influences on me developing my eventual mindset around money and, and valuing money. So even though I wasn't a good uh, magician, it was for a kid, I was pretty good and I was able to make some money doing it and have some funny stories to, uh, to tell later on in, in years. But yeah, that, that that's, so we okay, so what happens after this? I mean, I'm curious. Okay, you you get a flavor of entrepreneurialism, yeah. entrepreneur being an entrepreneur. You get a flavor of performance and how that can bring value to people's lives. You get a taste of the uh, the the superpower of once you have uh, means and money, you you, you can give other people uh, things that they want. Uh, and in some ways, that's kind of the the best part about having money. Um, and then how do you all how do how does this all I mean, before you get to the Bitcoin part of it, I'm just like, what happens? Like you're, you're 10 years old right now or something, right? So yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't discover Bitcoin. Are you 12 right now? <laughs> yeah, Dude, man, that I'm, facial hair. <laughs> I'm working on it. Yeah, no, I'm kidding. But no, what what, uh, what happens after that? Well, I eventually realized that and at, at this time too, I, my mom, I guess, decided she wanted to become a Mormon and, and brought us into the Mormon religion. And my dad was like Anglican or something like that, but we weren't re- very religious. The whole family, we would go to church occasionally, but like mom brought us to like the Mormon church as in like, you know, we're now Mormons. We're, we're following all these strict rules. I can't even have root beer, like <laughs> really weird rules. And you got to give 10% of everything you have to the church. That was the thing. It was tithing. Um, and that's eventually where I kind of came up with this idea for the Bitcoin tithing, which I, I was mm. trying to promote earlier in the summer but nobody was really responding to it because nobody wants to give away 10 percent of their money i think it would be a great idea if anybody that's making money with shit coins and ico investing and crypto exchanges and all this stuff by by leeching off the value of what bitcoin brings to the world and then and then making money off of bitcoin's brand recognition by selling altcoins and and, and flipping tokens and all this stuff if you just took 10% of the profits you're making from that and donated it back in towards developing the Bitcoin ecosystem to promote more freedom and liberty to the world and help get people out of financial oppression and things like that, I think that 10% Bitcoin tithing is a great idea and it should pick up steam. So somebody should make a little organization, Bitcoin tithing, that that targets exchange owners, wealthy altcoiners, 
EOS has like a massive treasury of Bitcoins right now. Um, Tezos has a massive treasury of Bitcoins right now. These guys are um, have life changing generational wealth. And I think they should give back to Bitcoin. I think everybody that's making money on Bitcoin and even on altcoins should give back a little tithing to Bitcoin. But that's not related to my story. That's just a mindset of giving that kind of I developed in the Mormon church. Mm. But um, sorry about that. I thought I had my notifications off here. Um, but yeah, so I was going to say is that I, I agree. I think we should. Uh, by the way, did you hear about this recent Bitcoin fund or something that everyone's talking about? I don't even know what it's called. HFR or something like that. Oh, the Human Rights Foundation? Yeah. Did you hear about this? Yeah. What's going on on that front? I mean, I haven't really dug in. It's Human Rights Foundation is I'm going to talk to Alex actually soon, have him on my podcast and talk about it more specifically. I don't know enough about it. All I know is that they're promoting human rights worldwide. Mm. They're 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 like an activist charity that promotes freedom and, and human rights. And they chose to support Bitcoin um, so that Bitcoin developers can continue to work on Bitcoin and not have to worry about finding jobs or, or whatever. And they're choosing mm. projects that like protect privacy and, and um, things like Wasabi. So you can, uh, if you're in an oppressive uh, country with an oppressive government, you can use mixing to hide your trail of your Bitcoin or clean, clean your Bitcoin so that it's harder for you to get tracked and, and, and tools like that. Okay, so let's go back to your story then. So tithing. Okay, so you get a flavor of tithing. You think it's important, but like, what happens after that? Yeah, like, okay. What's, I so, guess the big kind of yeah. So, so I realize about you know grade seven or eight or something that like, okay, people are making fun of me because I'm a clown and I'm a magician. This isn't really something I want to <laughs> I want to do for for my life. I don't, you know, it's not like, oh yeah, what do you do? I'm a clown. I'm a professional clown. Like that doesn't sound good. So it wasn't something I desired to stick uh, stick up with or stick with for, for my career choice, but I did like entertaining and I loved the comedy aspects of it and performing as a kid. Like I would do Christmas shows where Christmas Eve, you know, normal people are just with their family. I'm like entertaining 300 kids at this conference or something like that and uh, doing magic shows with we started eventually like using live animals and stuff too. Like we had, we were breeding doves and like breeding rabbits and all that stuff. So I would actually do like rabbits. Out of the a hat. serious operation. Oh man. Like I, we grew up, I had one time, that's why I got a, a fear of uh, rabbits because when I was in grade seven or eight and one of the places we moved to the, like the animals kind of got freaked out when we were moving all the time. And we had a cat and the cat was chasing the rabbit around the house and I tried, it like, it like ran behind the couch and I tried to shoo the cat away. So I was like, hey, get away from the, the rabbit. And I reached in and I shooed the cat away and the rabbit like glommed onto my wrist and they, they got sharp teeth. And it, I was like, oh my God. And I was like shaking the rabbit, trying to get it off. And it was like, not, it was like hanging off of my wrist. After that, I was so nervous on stage trying to do the magic show with the rabbit. I'm like, I don't want to touch this thing anymore. It's savage. <laughs> Okay, yeah. okay, okay. And then the resolution to that is one, one a, a, a like um, a German Shepherd ate all of our animals. No, <laughs> yeah. dude. Okay. So we kind of got forced out of the uh, the magic business because my mom, for some reason, thought it would be a good idea to leave the rabbits <laughs> outside in a cage, <laughs> and a and a German Shepherd just ripped through the thing and ate the rabbits. And, and we would take our doves to the beach with us, too, sometimes just to kind of like because they were trained doves, they would fly and come back. And one time we took them to a beach and they just flew away. <laughs> they just left. And I was like, no, see. those were like three thousand dollar Java doves that my mom like took out a credit card for and <laughs> tried to breed them. And now they just flew away. So we got lots of weird, weird, weird childhood stories. <laughs> wow okay 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 uh so when so i have a question so you live you said uh in, like near toronto now so did you like move here recently then or as a child yes closer? so i i eventually like as i said i didn't i didn't want to keep doing this magic show yeah and in high school uh i realized like i kind of want to do uh comedy like i want to do film and, and theater and sketch mm. comedy and things like that so i started to write plays and I got together with some friends my mom had enrolled us in drama classes and I had started networking with like other actors and things like that 
So in high school, I kind of realized, well, I wanted to do something that was <laughs> not as embarrassing, but still allowed me to do performing and things like that. Cause I, cause I really enjoyed it. So we, I would write sketch comedy plays and we kind of like an entrepreneurial little venture. We'd rent out the theater and then we'd sell tickets and then we'd keep all the, the proceeds of the, and how of old the, were you at this point? Like 17, something mm-hmm. like that. Cool. Cool. Okay. <laughs> So and you became was, a comedian. Um, <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I, I, right. I became like an actor, a local actor, and people loved it. We were doing like improv shows all around in the bars nice. and stuff. So I kind of kept up with performing, but more in a respectable way that <laughs> I didn't have to be embarrassed about. Thank God we didn't have Twitter and Facebook back then because we said some pretty crazy things. Like, could you imagine having everything you said as a 17 year old trying to be funny like and in the public record like you would never get a job in, <laughs> for the rest of your life you're stupid mm. when you're 17 these poor mm. kids these days growing up with this stuff mm, yeah it's a double-edged sword that's for sure that's for sure so interesting okay so so what then <laughs> all right so where are we i was high school you're high, you're doing comedy oh now. yeah you're from magician to comedian okay and then <laughs> And then I also, with like a with like a with like a, a spinal cord of you know entrepreneurialism <laughs> kind of throughout the throughout all of it. Okay. So and my my sister at this time is also in the magic show with me, and she's she's my assistant. So she's my assistant <laughs> in the magic show. And then when I started of getting course. into comedy, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then the comedy stuff, she started to also get into um, theater and comedy and she would mm-hmm. like act in the shows with us and stuff, but she started to gravitate more towards film. Mm-hmm. So she started wanting to like make movies and we would just make some funny sketches and stuff like that, film them. Um, so also at this time, I was like super into hacky sack, but like not just hacky sack, like foot bag, like the actual sport of hacky sack. There's an actual Mm. scoring system. There's like worldwide conferences that are held, competitions. (laughs) I got super into it. And I like was the leader of the Cape Breton footbag club. And so some random, like this was around 2000, 2001. It was around just after 9-11 or just around 9-11 happened. And for some reason, this this, uh, factory in Pakistan found me as the leader of the hacky sack group in Cape Breton and sent me a big, huge box, like a, like a big, huge sample of hacky sacks. And I was like, you know, young and naive. And I was like, what is this? Is this a setup or something? It's like, (laughs) am I, is this like drugs inside of this hacky sack? And like, you know, (laughs) this is a terrorist attack or something like, I'm so dumb. You, you think when you're young, like you you just absorb like, the dumb information that you're being given by comedy and, and and like Saturday Night Live as if that's world news, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All these ridiculous scenarios that happen in sketches and on the like late night comedy shows. It happened. This crazy thing happened to me. I'm like, oh my god, am I getting set up? Am I gonna get arrested? I got some free hacky sacks. What the hell is inside? Is this, is this actually sand? What is this? So after a little while, I realized, wait, okay, this is just real hacky sacks. Why the hell are they sending it to me? Are you on the internet by now? Like, how did they even find you? Yeah, because because, you just said there's no Twitter and stuff. So how did they get you? Yeah, because there was footbag.org, which yeah. was the worldwide, like, Hello. Okay, so you are kind of on the, okay, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was big into the internet. Like, I got on the internet when I was, like, 12 or something like that. Hmm. Um, I was I was just super into, like, hacking and and like script kitty stuff when i was when i was young i just thought it was so hilarious to be able to like hack into someone's computer and listen to their microphone or open a <laughs> cd tray or something like that with with a plasma bear or something no what is it called? When, when did you get your first computer do you remember uh it was probably like 12 or something like that it must have been like 11 or 12 mm. no i just think it was like yeah 11 yeah it was 11 because it was windows 95 no it was windows 3.1 so 10 10 or 11 crappy mm. like 386 you know it's mm. a, a real piece of junk mm. but anyways i started selling these hacky sacks around locally and and then i realized okay these guys think i'm a big operation so maybe i can place a big order and they'll give me a big discount and i was conversing back and forth with them with the idea that like through email that i'm just going to be i'm going to be like getting free hacky sacks that i can play with and eventually realized, wait, this could actually be a business because these guys think I'm like a big supplier in Canada. I'm a big 
footbag like seller or something like that. <laughs> so I'm like, well, maybe I can get a whole bunch of them and then get them at like 60% off and then sell them at uh, full price. And then I'll make some money to be able to like go and leave Cape Breton and like travel and, and try to do comedy in Toronto or something like that. So that was the plan. It was like save up some money and then learn to go like <laughs> through entrepreneurial stuff, like selling footbags hilariously. And I eventually did sell enough that I was able to also take a student loan, but like go to Toronto to Humber College, which was a school for sketch comedy, improv, um, film, things like that. Mm. So I went to the Humber College creative writing program uh, with a buddy of mine and, and pretty much paid our way to get there with hacky sacks from Pakistan and a student loan that was pretty small student loan, but still a student loan. I was surprised. I was like, wow, they're going to give me money. They're going to give me like $10,000. I don't have a job or anything. I'm flipping hacky sacks. I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take whatever money you're going to give me. So that was my, uh, my journey to get to, to Toronto. Wait, what, what was that deal look like? So like you, did you have to pay them up front or were they, did they just front you the, the goods? Cause they're willing to give you a free box. So did you just use that I first think, inventory to kind of get things off the ground? Yeah, no, I thought, I thought I was, I thought I was scamming them. I was like, I was in the mindset of like, oh my God, these guys are so dumb. They're just sending some dumb kids, some, some hacky sacks. I could, I could be, I'm not even a, I'm not even a big supplier, Meanwhile, I'm sending them the money first. Totally naive Mormon kid being like, I, I'm sending them a thousand dollars that I had saved up and being like, I'm scamming them. Like they could have easily just been take it, take off, right? And, and not not actually give but me they that. They gave you a free box, right? They gave you a free they, box. No, they gave, were you able to like sell some of those and I don't know, make some of your initial capital? Or? <laughs> well, at the very beginning, when it first happened, I was just so surprised that they were going to send me this box of samples that I was, they were like, sir, we see that you're the leader of the footbag club in Cape Breton. I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, I'm a very professional footbag club leader and I will accept your box of samples because that's what I need. I want that. <laughs> you know, I was trying to be professional. I just sounded like a dumb kid probably, but they sent it to me anyway for free. I got like 30 or 40 hacky sacks. Nice. And then I like started to sell them basically like in the school parking lots out of my trunk. <laughs> as if i was selling drugs i had a few people like teachers come out after me like say what are you doing here because <laughs> i was like literally in the high school parking lots in my shitty car opening up the trunk kids running around me like oh i want one i want some because <laughs> i was selling uh, but i was selling hacky sacks not not drugs hacky sacks seems like a very random but perhaps super useful skill like to be able to kick a tidy ball with your feet i mean come on your feet having dexterity over that seems like a use i took taekwondo for a bunch of years when i was yeah. a kid, and, and to this day i can i can do a spinning back kick <laughs> yeah man that's the thing so, like, you know <laughs> you know growing up in the in the age of like power rangers and ninja turtles everybody wanted to be able to 100%. do a spin kick of course <laughs> so like being able to do all these crazy hacky sack moves like jump kicks moves and stuff like that clipper whirlwinds and all this stuff it was really developing uh ambidextrous skills in both sides of your body and it was really good for fitness i, I was like really overweight as a kid and during the magic shows like like i'm this huge kid like way overweight doing this magic show stuff and then in high school as i started to become a hacky sack peddler i lost a bunch of weight <laughs> playing hacky sack so it kind of developed a little bit of uh, self-confidence as well from from an entrepreneurial hobby of hacky sack selling man this is awesome what a, what a great story okay so what happened i've then? never so told this story before right? this is such a uh, we've gotten in here to talk about bitcoin i'm talking about my magic show and my clown show and my hacky sack but it all it all adds up, man. It all adds up. No, it's like what what is Steve Jobs' is famous saying? How like you can't connect the dots looking forward, but you can kind of looking back, right? And so this is why I'm this is why I'm doing this is because I'm just learning so many cool things about people. <laughs> okay, so wow, that that's very interesting. I mean, I'll tell you right now, I was not selling hacky sacks. I wish I was. <laughs> um, I was I was probably in the chess club or I don't know, like in the badminton team, like nerding out. <laughs> but uh okay so what what happens after this well i i also like something really weird or funny kind of happened i was in that stuff too i was like the the nerdy kid in school 
So like I said, I was moving around a lot, didn't have time to make a lot of friends and sort of like never had anybody I'd like go sleep over at their house or anything like that. It was more like, oh yeah, I would just interact with people and, and kind of get to know people for a year or two, but then like move on. So there was this one school that I went to in grade seven, eight, that was, um, it was like stereotypical, mean principal, crazy kids, like these kids would torture the teachers like the french teacher one time they took his car keys and threw them on the roof and and like laughed at him and and was like you know these are this was like in a small town in cape breton like on the east coast small town people would like in grade seven or eight they would at recess they'd just like go down to the wharf and like smoke drugs and have sex and stuff like it was not it was it was uh, it was like and i'm just this like nerdy magician clown (laughs) I didn't fit in very well there, right? <laughs> so I would just nerdy magician clown. Yeah, I yeah. was a nerdy magician into clown. Into computers. <laughs> into computers. You know, also in the honors club, like working with the principal. The principal was like leading the honors club. And I was like, you know, going after school and going at lunch and doing doing the honors club. So people, people like stereotypical like nerdy kid in this hard high school or whatever. And at lunchtime, there was a giant buoy on the front lawn <laughs> and we would go practice our ninja moves outside of the buoy. So they called us the Power Rangers. But then this one time, my dad was, you know, selling uh, bread and eggs and all that stuff. And he delivered to the reserve. Um, so the where the natives have the ability to have firecrackers, right? So firecrackers, I guess, were illegal outside of the reserve. But somebody sold my dad a bunch of bricks of firecrackers and my dad thought it would be a good idea to let me become an entrepreneur by selling firecrackers at high school. And I Love I it. was naive. I'm this like nerdy Mormon kid, nerdy Mormon clown, right? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'll make them. I can sell them for like 10 cents a firecracker. Like, yeah, I'll make some money to, have, to buy some candy at, at, at lunchtime. So dad gives me these firecrackers and I go to school and I find like, you know, one of the kids that usually like make fun of me or bully me. And I was like, Hey, do you want to buy some firecrackers? And they're like, yeah, right. Like you have firecrackers. Sure. Cause it was pretty hard to get firecrackers back then. I don't know. Maybe it still is, but I remember, um, at the word spread amongst the kids that I had firecrackers and it was like, and they were uh, 25 cents a pop. But at lunchtime I got swarmed like, like a, like a piranha with a piece of, cow meat or whatever thrown in i was just like these kids came at me from everywhere as soon as the bell rang and like we're just tossing pennies and nickels and, and quarters at me and it was just like i was just didn't know what to do people were just grabbing all the firecrackers from me and i got left with a handful of change and some change all around my feet and then i just had this moment of dread like what did i just do because it was all the bad kids you know it was all those like kids that were gonna <laughs> be up to nothing you know no good and then you start hearing firecrackers go off. They're throwing them at the teachers, putting them in, putting them in, in lockers. And I'm just sitting the, like you know, during class too, like during the, the rest of the day, I'm sitting there like, oh my God, I just, I'm going to go to jail. Like, I, I don't know why I did this. I was so terrified. I thought I had just done the worst thing in the world. Cause in the middle of class, you're hearing firecrackers go off in the lockers outside. And then around like three o'clock, Right at the end of the day, when the bell was about to ring, the principal, who's the meanest, like stereotypical red face principal that <laughs> all the kids are afraid of, comes over the, the PA as quiet as possible. He says, uh, could Brad Mills please come to the Fuck. office? And I was like, my heart sank. I was like, I'm not getting out of this. Like, even though I'm like the honors kid and like the, t- the principal loves me, like I just committed this crazy act that disrupted the whole school and caused people to be throwing firecrackers at each other. I'm dead. Like they're going to expel me. (laughs) So I'm terrified. I go down to the principal's office and the principal and the vice principal are there. So then I know I'm in shit. The principal's in the corner. It's just like with his typical red, angry face, the vice principal's got his arms crossed and he's, they're talking to each other. Right. And they're like quiet. I can't hear them. The vice principal looks over at me. He says, just sit down. And so I'm like, my heart is racing. I don't know what the hell is going to happen to me. And a minute later, the vice principal looks over and he says, do you know why you're here? And I said, 
Yes, it was me. I I sold all the firecrackers. I'm so sorry. I didn't know I was doing anything wrong. It was me. I, 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 I promise I won't do it again. And the both of them just like started cracking up laughing. And they were shocked. And they were like, that was you? What do you? What, what do you mean that was you? That wasn't you. How could that be you? And I was like, well, why else did you call me down here? I thought I was in trouble. And they're like, no, we have a note to give to the bus driver. And you're the only student we trust with the note. No. And I was ah! like, <laughs> <laughs> dope. So I just, I, I thought I was in shit, but it turns out that because I was such a good kid, they let me off the hook. They didn't even say anything to me about it because they saw how terrified I was and that I would never, ever do it again. Were they even stressed about the fireworks? Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but they knew that I was like, they knew I was the nerdy Mormon kid and I just made a mistake and that I would never do it again. They could tell how terrified I was. And I ratted myself out. I was mm. so, I was so honest and naive that I ratted myself out. <laughs> they didn't have a clue. Okay. They didn't know it was me. They didn't know who it was, but I ratted myself out. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I think that like that uh, moral sort of naivety or naivete or whatever, I've never really dropped it. It's like still with me, you know, and, and that's that's one of the reasons why I get so triggered all the time on Twitter about like ICO coins and altcoins and Roger Ver trying to say Bitcoin cash is Bitcoin. It, it just puts me right back into that mode of being this like nerdy Mormon kid that's can't believe that people are going to lie or that people are going to take advantage of others. So that's something I've always struggled with on Bitcoin Twitter. You know what I mean? Like trying to promote the good, the goodness about Bitcoin and, and also to be the defender of Bitcoin and, and like trying to defend against all these attacks that are coming. It's, it's, that's why I think I have white in my beard. <laughs> hey, hey Brad, I think I lost actually. you. I, I, your focus is a little off. I don't know if you went back to the auto or manual mode or whatever Let's it was. That. Hey, we go. back. Okay, this is shaping up, and now we haven't even gotten it. to like 18 yet, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what's next what happens after this so wow okay i yeah i'll keep the rest short i mean th these are fun <laughs> funny stories i don't know why i'm telling all this stuff but i that's my like i'm just i was just a normal normal kid <laughs> i guess that's not really a normal kid is it <laughs> nah nah uh no but I'm, I wasn't kidding. Like... I'm kidding man I, mean, I do i have firework stories my parents made me do acting i was aladdin nice. my brother was abu i could go oh. on about like weirdness but but i want to hear yours first so so keep going <laughs> well you know then I, I kind of uh got like i said into high school and i decided i wanted to become an actor and like uh write write comedy sketches and stuff and then go to go to uh Toronto and so I eventually did go to Toronto and my goal there was to write a screenplay and, and film a movie and I had heard of some people in Cape Breton that had got a grant from the government to make a movie and I started like mm. looking into the film industry a little bit and seeing like how do you produce a film how do you get funding for a film and, you know, mm. there's some shenanigans there where I met some really weird people who were going to try to, like, fund my movie that I had written in, in college. But eventually, you know, I, I networked with a, um, a bunch of funny, like, hilarious Canadian kids and even some, some American kids came to Humber. And we did, like, stand-up comedy at Yuck Yucks and sketch comedy at um, different bars and different comedy clubs around town. We started doing more and more comedy uh, we do improv, things like that. But what what really spoke to me was the the movie side of it. So I really wanted to make the movie. I didn't want to I didn't want to go up and like do a stand up set. And then that's forgotten, like that moment happened and it's gone. I was more interested in putting all my energy and like writing a screenplay that then you'd record it and then you could play it over and over again because it was always a great moment when the audience was like enjoying something, but then I always felt like it was a bad investment. I was like, you know, you, you, you put all that time and energy and the rehearsal and everything into that one moment. And then it's gone. It felt like I almost needed something that could retain the, the value put in better. And to me, that was a film because once you put all that rehearsal time and all that energy into it, it's there. It's, you can watch it again. You can have a re-enjoyment forever with less effort. 
So even though I was like in that industry, I was still thinking as an investor. Now that I'm realizing it, actually, the way I was looking at it was was like an investment versus a sort of get um, a quick hit or a trade or something like that. I was looking at my art as an investment of like a store of value of, of enjoyment. So that's why I decided to want to go into film. And it was like nobody wanted to give me any money to make a movie because I'm this nerdy magician mormon kid well at this point i decided because when you turn 19 in the mormon religion you you, you got to go on a mission so you got to become a missionary and go to go to another country and spread the gospel and all this stuff and i decided i wanted to just live a normal life and i don't want to have to repent every time i watch a jim carrey movie like i just want to be a normal person so that's how I decided to go to uh, Toronto and kind of get out of the, the Mormon religion and um, started to kind of like, I always kept that, that, that foundational moral um, training or whatever that I had as, as a kid. And I think it provided some value, but it also made me really naive. I always thought everybody was just honest and no one's going to lie to you and no one's going to be bad no one's going to like think of their side of the deal more than your side of the deal so i always had this naivety and then it was like i i googled how do i make money online because i needed to raise fifty thousand dollars to make my movie and the government wasn't given to me i couldn't find anybody that wanted to give me money to make the movie so that's my shift into how do I make money myself? And how to like, what the hell is this money thing anyways? Because no one's going to give me any, I got to figure out how to make it myself. So it was literally all that stuff about, you know, I didn't have a silver spoon. I didn't come from money. I didn't have a foundational knowledge about money. I was just a normal person. I wasn't wealthy. I was in debt. And I just wanted to make a movie to fund my passion. And I Googled, how do you make money online when I was like 22? And that eventually led me to Bitcoin. <laughs> hmm. uh, wait, so what, what year are we in now? 2004. 2005, yeah. So you didn't discover Bitcoin that early, obviously, because it wasn't out. Oh, but yeah. Like, but I, when did you come across it eventually? So my, I, mean that, I came hmm. into Bitcoin in 2011. Hmm. But I had, I'd started to learn about entrepreneurial like how to be your own boss and things like that from, from Googling. I got scammed a lot. I got like these sur paid to read surveys, send us a hundred bucks and we'll send you this, this list of surveys where you can make a thousand dollars. You know, you PayPal them the money or you send them actually e-gold. I got into e-gold, which is kind of like one of the precursors to Bitcoin mm. because there was a lot of these scams that accepted e-gold because there was no chargebacks. Mm. <laughs> so I got scammed quite a bit, but it eventually like led me to like, set up an, an account with e-gold and start to learn about gold because i was like you know gold is about 400 dollars an ounce at the time and you know i'd put like 500 dollars of my savings or my my income from my job or whatever my ei check whatever it was and i'd put it online into e-gold and then i'd start trying to like do these auto surf things where apparently they're going to show advertising to people and every day you make 10 percent on your on your money you deposit i was getting scammed left and right with paid to read emails and paid survey scams and um, affiliate marketing scams and um, Ponzi scam, like legit Ponzi scams and pyramid Le schemes. Legit Ponzi schemes. I like that one. Yeah. Like, like, <laughs> you know, the actual Ponzi scam. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, like yeah. where oh, literally Ponzi. Done that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> so so yeah, this, the, yeah. The school, yeah, of, the school of hard knocks, man. I actually got scammed out of most of the money I didn't even have trying to figure <laughs> out how to make money online. But eventually it led me to a network marketing business that was just a pyramid scheme, not a Ponzi scheme. It was only a pyramid scheme. <laughs> <laughs> but this pyramid scheme taught me some really valuable stuff. They started recommending I read books like How to Win Friends and Influence People or As a Man Thinketh mm. or, um, mm. you know, uh, what's some other, there's some, Think and, grow, Think and rich. grow rich. Yeah. All, all, all these like rich dad, poor dad, <laughs> Yeah, rich dad, oh, poor dad, all these foundational <laughs> mindset books. Of course. Mm. And the lessons I learned there was I still, I still come back to them today. So when people talk about 
MLM stuff like multi-level marketing or network marketing or whatever, I kind of have a little soft spot in my heart for it because if you find the right one and you really plug into their training, you can learn some really valuable stuff that that'll serve you for the rest of your life. I just recommend like, don't burn out your friends and family, like warm network on trying to sell them magic pills and stuff like that. But the one that really, um, the one that really, the ones that will really help will be the ones that train you how to prospect and how to like find how to generate your own leads online or how to, how to buy leads and then process those leads and um, try to recruit people to your business and teach you about value and savings and things like that. So any, any network marketing company that has a focus on mindset and self development and entrepreneurship, like really starting a business and not just sell our gas pill because it's going to be make you rich or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really think those are valuable <laughs> for someone just starting out because yeah, I agree it's too. good mindset mm-hmm. training. Mm-hmm. So eventually, you know, after a couple of years of doing this MLM stuff, working at a gas station, trying to like learn about money at the same time, I realized that the whole idea about being your own boss is kind of a scam with network marketing because I got fired from my network marketing company <laughs> from my network marketing job <laughs> Because I I was a I had a real entrepreneurial desire to like make fifty grand, and my goal they were telling me like you know if you find two people and help them find two people and help them find two people you're gonna make ten thousand dollars a month after one year, so I was like you know I'm gonna do this that's a, that's a goal I can set my sights to that I'm gonna do that I'm gonna make ten thousand dollars a month, and I'm gonna find two people and help them find two people and help them find two people and before you know it I'm gonna have ten thousand dollars a month this is gonna be great and it's only gonna take a year. <laughs> been there done that <laughs> continue so i did it man i recruited like 150 people to my network marketing holy thing. shit okay i like yeah. i was like working eight hours shift at the at the at the shitty minimum wage mm. job delivery driver mm. job gas station job whatever and then i'd come home online and i'm like hustling and like working another six eight hours on my network marketing business doing phone calls prospecting trying to do marketing trying to like so naive thinking people are loving this and like buying leads from this company where they're selling me leads for like $2 a piece, claiming that these are people that want to make money in the business when it's really just somebody that got their info scraped from like a hack or something like that, or a magazine database or something like that. And I'm like, so I'll call them up. So you want to make money online? Do you? I can help you out. And they're like, who the hell is this? How'd you get my number? (laughs) But anyways, I, I, after a year I had recruited, I did that thing where you find two and you find and I was making like two or $3,000 a month, which is good for network marketing. I mean, most people don't make any money with that, mm. but I really hustled. I treated it like a, like a real job and went through all the training, read all the books they recommended. And as I was going through all these books, I realized like, wait a second, this network marketing thing is, is a scam. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, they taught me good. And they taught me like how to get the hell out of it because it wasn't actually going to meet my goals because I was all about, you know, and at the same time, I'm learning about e-gold and then gold because I'm like, so so what is this e-gold then? How is gold on the internet? You know, 2005 or whatever, it's six. And using e-gold and sending gold around on the internet, like from these affiliate marketing things, paying for leads, things like that. And then going through like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, where Robert Kiyosaki talks about the history of money and the value of gold and why gold you should buy gold and uh, get into real estate because it's a scarce asset, things like that. I started to get this foundational knowledge about money and (laughs) the the things I learned showed me that, okay, if you want to actually generate your own money, you can't, you you shouldn't be reliant on a third party. And Mm. this network marketing company was this trusted third party that was peddling this message about you're going to be your own boss, but they're paying you every month. And if you do anything that violates the rules, they're going to kick you out. So I decided I want multiple streams of income. So not only am I going to do this one, I'm going to start selling my own leads to people. And I'm going Robert to do Allen? this Sorry. here. That's the name of a book as well, I think. <laughs> Which one? Multiple streams of income. But anyways, mm. carry on, carry on. Okay. So what, what, what else did you diversify into? Well, I started generating my own leads because I'm like, I'm mm. buying leads every, I'm spending like $500 a month. I'm spending all my paycheck on all these leads. Mm. I'm going to generate my own leads. Mm. So, I, so I started a website to generate um, biz op leads, they call, where people are interested in making money online. You know, it was like, I did the website myself. I bought a script and I edited it and I did all the graphics and it was, it was like a crappy website, 
but it did the job and I started generating leads. I was like doing paid to read stuff where people would earn like five cents to, to click an ad or something like that. And then they'd give their info and then I would sell the lead to somebody who was doing network marketing saying like, hey, if you want to get paid more, then you can talk to this person. So it was like opt in biz op leads where people were interested in the idea of making money online. So you sell them to a network marketing person who's going to then pitch them on their business. And I'd make like two or three bucks a lead off that. So one time I, I, I had two separate email lists that I kept. One was like all the people, all the people I respected, all the like influential people that I respected in the network marketing business, like the uplines and the, and the CEO and all this stuff and the trainers and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. my other list was all my leads that I had recruited. Right. Hmm. And I was wanting to sell my leads to my, all the people I had recruited into the business. And by accident, I copied the other <laughs> email list into the message where I was pitching them my leads. So I was, I'm pitching the CEO of the company and the other trainers and the other lead providers on buying my shitty leads from my stupid page read site. And they kicked me out of the business for that. They're like, sorry, that's not allowed. You're, you're cross recruiting. You're not allowed, you, you know, your, 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 uh, your account or whatever is closed. So that was like three grand a month that I was making that just kind of evaporated. And that was like a, a very, eventually, thankfully, it was like my, my biz up thing that I was doing started just generating a couple thousand dollars a month. So it like totally replaced the income that I was making on the MLM thing. But I wasn't upset about it because I was like, you guys promised me I was going to be making 10 grand a month if I did all this. Hey, I did all this. I'm only making two or three. So I, I quit anyways. You know, they were threatening to close my thing. And they said one more time, one strike, you know, one more strike, you're, you're gone. And I said, okay, I'm not going to go through the process of reactivating the account. I'm not going to send you my sign the document saying I won't do this again. I'm done because you said I was going to make 10 grand a month. And I'm only making two or three. So this is no good. I don't like this. I'm going to actually start my own business. Interesting. Okay. So then you did and that kind of took off a bit. And then what, what came out for that? Well, well, at this point, I'm still totally broke for all intents and purposes. I'm living with my in-laws, you know, my, my wife's, uh, at the time, my girlfriend's parents, because we couldn't afford our own place because I was throwing every cent I had into the network marketing lead generation thing. And her parents thought I was crazy. Oh, you're losing me again. One sec. Yeah. <clears throat> Logitech. Logitech, you suck. Still... <laughs> hey, yo, hey, yo. Yeah, I'll just pause it. But we're back. Yeah. Oh, we're back. Okay. So we're going to start over. So I was born in 1982 and oh God, I was a no. magician no, and a clown. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're talking about, we're talking about the, um, the idea of like starting my own business. Is that yeah. where, where we were? So you were, you were at the biz ops business. You're now you've replaced your, your, uh, MLM, uh, businesses income. And, and now you're, you're living with your, your girlfriend, future wife's family. Yeah. And they can't, uh, love you more. <laughs> so the, the, then I'm like I'm 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 seeing that um, Facebook is starting to pick up. This is like 2007 or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I had all these ideas, and I was trying to do like a hot or not, but for businesses, and like just all these different random ideas I was coming up with 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 ideas for the web and ways to generate money online. But I'm, the whole time, the goal is to fil film this movie. So I'm just like, I need to make that $50,000 because it, it's like been a few years since I wrote the movie. I'm seeing my friends are going to like Yuck Yucks and, or um, Just for Laughs Festival and doing some really cool things in, in stand-up comedy world and stuff. And I'm just like over here peddling leads online, like getting scammed and Ponzi schemes. Like, this is not what I wanted to do. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't set out for this. I want to make some money so I can make this movie and get into the film business. So... Eventually, it was like about half a year um, of trying these random ideas on Facebook uh, because Facebook came out and there was it was a new traffic source. There was this thing called Facebook Flyers, which was the precursor to Facebook ads, where it was like really undeveloped at the time. It was just a text ad on the side of Facebook. And there was all these networks that allowed you to like PHP hack with iframes to show more ads to people's pages if they if they installed your uh, your widget your facebook app you know if you were on facebook in the early days you remember there was things like 
the graffiti wall where you could install this little widget and then people could draw on your Facebook wall or, or like the vampire app where you could bite your friend and they become a vampire. And then you've got to bite somebody else and they become a vampire. <clears throat> so all these people started to develop these hidden ad networks inside of these apps, which would use a PHP or iframes or, and then just like transpose an ad outside of the Facebook frame. And you could generate more revenue by promoting affiliate offers or even your own Facebook app or whatever. And the same thing happened with payments. There was a couple of payment processors on Facebook in the early days. Like it was kind of like Facebook, uh, it was kind of like Bitcoin talk in the early days where a lot of entrepreneurs were just hanging out on the Bitcoin talk forums, just chatting about ideas and raising money and, and building things on the Facebook or on the uh, Bitcoin talk forums. That was on the Facebook developer forum too. It was kind of like the same community type of community of just hackers and builders and uh, entrepreneurs trying to like network and buy and sell things and start up businesses. So I was hanging out there and I was w way enjoying myself more hanging out with these real entrepreneurs than I was with like the network marketing people. Cause half the people in network marketing were just fake and you could tell like they were just selling a story. They weren't actually the person that they were pretending to be on their CDs and their, and their, and their websites and stuff, but hanging around with real entrepreneurs, it was much more enjoyable because it was authentic. Like everybody was just hustling and just, they weren't hiding the fact that they were just trying to make some money. <laughs> like most people were just like, I want to get rich. <laughs> and this is an idea I have where, where the people with MLM, it was a lot of like faking their, you know, they're so good. They're so good. And you know, they're here for the, the product, which the product has always sucked for the most part. So I kind of liked that um, vibe about uh, more uh, being an entrepreneur, like with actual coders and, and entrepreneurs there. And so I came up with this random idea one day and I, I pushed it out on Facebook. I partnered with a coder and a money guy who I'd met from the network marketing business. And I was like, okay, let's do a three-way split here. I'll, I'll be the idea guy. I'll like come up with all the code or the idea for the code. You can code it. And then this other dude, you can do the bookkeeping and fund everything. So we need, we need like $10,000, which at the time to me was like, I could never come up with that money. You know, I, I would not be able to come up with that money because my bills, even though I was making some money from that lead business, it was like all going out and bills and student loan payments and all this stuff. <clears throat> so I'm still not in a great financial position. So I took on this angel investor, partnered with a coder. We pushed the game out and it got at like a hundred thousand active players in the first month and like a million downloads. Wow. And that, that was like years and years and years of getting scammed and learning about how to start a business and how to like hustle and not to give up. Mm. And all those lessons about prospecting and getting through all the no's to get to the yes mm -hmm. worked in the end for me because I must have started 50 failed businesses and failed apps and stuff before that one worked. And that one app changed my life. So that that one app started randomly with some guy bootstrapped two or three thousand dollars of expenses maybe the guy said he'd put up 10 but in the end we only needed a couple thousand because it worked right away it started generating us like the first year we made like a million dollars off of it oh okay and, and to me like you know this nerdy clown magician that wants to make a movie you know all this stuff that i grew up with like it was life-changing I, I i finally had achieved this goal i was setting and trying to work towards and it was awesome. I remember just feeling like this is like, I just hacked the matrix. Like I found a way to break out of this cycle and to create a different trajectory for my life and my family. And now I can make my movie. Like this is finally it. Like I can finally make this freaking movie. I don't have to rely on the government. I don't have to get the funding. I, I have this community now of these players that love this game I made and I can crowdfund it from them <clears throat> and use my own money that I'm generating. So we did that. We, we, we crowdfunded the film. We raised $50,000. This is before Kickstarter or any of that stuff, just from a kind of like campaign that I did on the game. Cause so we had all these players that loved the thing. And I was like, Hey, by the way, I'm also doing this movie. I wrote, does anybody want to help? Like if you support it, you'll get some shit in the game. Like we give them free currency and stuff. And then I went and made the movie in 2008. We, we made the movie. Um, my sister had gone to film school. She kept up with the film. She, she networked and developed this really good relationship with um, all these fi Canadian filmmaker kids that were 
are still in the film industry. Like she's actually right now working on a Sundance documentary. She got funded from Sundance to do this documentary about Sable Island. So she's, she's doing really well in film, but anyways, we did this, we did this uh, film. We went in the woods for 22 days in Cape Breton. We shot a movie about a crazy forest ranger that chops up a bunch of teenagers trying to have sex and litter and party. Um, the idea that I had for it was like, I wanted to make a movie that I could watch <laughs> as, as this like ner nerdy Mormon kid. I'm like, I wanted to make a, P a PG 13 cheesy eighties horror movie that, that a kid could enjoy because I just love the culture of like comedy, and like cheesy movies. I love making fun of psycho cop and Friday the 13th. And you know, I'll do like a comedy horror. Yeah, it's a comedy horror. It's a comedy. Wow. horror. Movie. Wow. Okay. So what happens to that movie? Oh, we did great with it. We, we made it. Um, it was authentic. It was, it was like, is it on the internet? I gotta put something? it, I gotta go, I gotta put it back up on tour. we had a distributor for a while, uh, a Canadian distributor and a US distributor. It didn't do well. I never made my money back. Like it, it ended up that <laughs> I needed to put another $50,000 into it because of post-production costs that I wasn't factoring in. Mm. So, I, so I had 50 in and then we made it. And then my business had just taken off. So it was kind of like I had man, I was managing these two things at once, this, this filmmaking career <laughs> and, and this, and this entrepreneurial career. And I started just making lots of money and I was like, okay, well, I got to get a house. I got to start getting some gold because now I have money. I got to protect it. And it was like around that exact same time that Ron Paul was running for president and I was making money. And I was like, now that I have the money, I got to do something with it. I can't just leave it in dollars because Robert Kiyosaki says that dollars suck. So I started to like find Ron Paul, like Ron Paul led me down the rabbit hole to, you know, the whole Ron Paul campaign led me down the rabbit hole to libertarianism and Austrian economics. And then, you know, I just continued to learn about what I should do with this money I started to generate because I had no clue. You know, I knew mindset stuff and I, I finally had achieved that goal. But then it was like, what do I do with it now? Now that I have some money coming in and I started to divest into like, I built a house and um, started to buy some gold and silver in, you know, and I had, I had previously had the e-gold account e-gold got shut down by that time and i'd lost all my gold that was an e-gold because the government shut it down so i was realizing okay well if i'm gonna get gold i need real gold i don't want paper gold or electronic gold because that can be taken away that can be shut down if there's a real crisis or whatever and i'm so i'm like my facebook game is is like is still very popular still generating lots of money for us for years like a few years on and I'm like managing an economy of a digital game. I'm becoming like a digital currency economist. <laughs> like while trying to finish this movie, I'm like dealing with hyperinflation of my virtual currencies and stuff like that. Trying to like, you know, going to GDC events, networking with game developers, all that stuff. So I'm like building these two careers. Um, and the, the film took like three years to finish because I was focused more on the money because the money was coming in and I had to deal with it. You know, it was like, okay, wh what do I want to do here? The, the film is really creatively fulfilling, but it's not going to make me any money. And it's a lot of work. Um, I'm glad I did it, but the money was coming in. And so I had to focus on it. So I accidentally became an entrepreneur or whatever because of this movie. And I ended up doing it. We finished it 2011. We had like a premiere and, Sydney we did a show we did multiple theatrical screenings around and sold out it was just awesome to see it in film festivals and stuff and see how the audience would react I really I really had a good time with that I really want to do it again sometime I, I think it's a uh, kind of like one of the one of the passion things that I that I'd love to do again for sure you think a movie about your life dude <laughs> oh man <laughs> right <laughs> okay okay so so we haven't even talked about bitcoin when does that come into your life eventually through facebook stuff or how did that you know it was it was again 2011 um first of all gold or sil silver had just ran from like 20 dollars to like 35 dollars and i had been paying attention to it since 2008 gold and silver but i didn't i wasn't like stacking like crazy but at, during the, you know, the Occupy Wall Street and everything and, and following Ron Paul, I started to learn about 
central banking and fractional reserve banking. And when I went down that rabbit hole in 2008, 2009 of fractional reserve banking, I kind of felt like my whole reality was shattered. It like I was, it didn't look deeply into money before. And it was almost like discovering aliens to me. It was like, this is like a different paradigm. Like how in the hell can money not be <laughs> backed by anything, but not just backed by anything, but, but all the money in your bank account is not real. How is that possible? What the hell is happening in the world that nobody's paying attention to this? And, and how are they able to just print trillions of dollars to bail out all these banks that caused the financial collapse to happen in 2008? So I started just getting really like enraged by the fact that central banks are causing all this wealth inequality and that it's unfair and poor people like, like me and all my family that had grown up were basically being enslaved by debt. And these guys are just printing money and making more and more money. It just felt so unfair. And so I got really into politics with, with the Ron Paul uh, campaign. I started like raising money for them, making Facebook apps and trying to, trying to just spread the, the, the message of like freedom and liberty mm. and, and the Fed or audit the Fed or mm. just let's pay attention to money because this is a huge scam and it's, it's hurting anybody who's trying to save their money. And, and the, you know, the, the disparity of wealth, it sucked for me as a capitalist to see that everybody was like blaming capitalism for, for this wealth disparity when it was actually these scam artists that were like printing the money and giving it to their friends and bailing out their banker friends for taking all these obscene risks, committing fraud, repackaging mm. toxic debt and putting it into these um, reverse collateralized debt shit and like just creating all these quant like complex derivatives that were toxic and, and selling it to the government and, and selling it to each other and just painting over the whole thing. It just felt like I was, I was such a big scam. So I, that, that's when I started to pay more attention to gold and Bitcoin or sorry, gold and, and silver. So I started stacking a little bit, but in 2011, when silver started to run, that was like the FOMO moment for me. I'm like, okay, I got to get some of this stuff. So it's moving. Like all these people have been saying gold's going to go to $10,000 and silver's going to go to $2,000. I'm like, oh, it's up to, tw it's from $20 to $30. Now it's going to $40. I better get some silver because these guys are right. Look at all the money they're printing. Like the Occupy Wall Street movement was going really big. And um, the audit, the Fed movement was, and the Fed movement was going big because Ron Paul was running again for a second term. So I'm like, I got to just commit here. I'm going to diversify into silver. So I started to look into silver research, like YouTube videos on how do you get silver mm -hmm. as a Canadian. And there was this one dude, you got to interview this guy, Da Vinci Jeremy. Have you heard of him? He's the reason I learned. about. He's Bitcoin. the reason I learned about Bitcoin. And he's, and from, he's Toronto. from Toronto. I've tried. I'm trying to interview <laughs> him, dude, but he's got some like gatekeepers. They, they don't, they don't, they don't. I, I've never met him personally, but uh, he is probably, I don't know exactly, but He's among the top two. He's got to be the guy because there's all the others that were. No, he's got to be. You, I'll give yeah, you a dab. I, mean, I don't know for sure. Boom. Yeah. Okay. So, so, he, so I found there's, there's so many things that you've said, though, that I'm just like, dude, that, that, that. <laughs> but I'm just trying to keep my mouth shut here because I'm like, okay, keep going. Well, keep going. Da Vinci was this popular kind of like alternative channel on YouTube for gold and silver collectors. And there was this other dude, too, that was a, a popular Canadian channel for silver. But he, but Da Vinci and him used to kind of go at each other a little bit because this one dude from Vancouver was just a gold bug, like just a gold and silver bug, a metals guy. And Da Vinci was started to talk about Bitcoin. He would say, like, you know, when you're getting your gold and silver, don't forget about this Bitcoin thing. It's like digital gold. And I'm going to guarantee anybody that buys Bitcoin that it won't go below a dollar. And I'll refund your money if you buy Bitcoin and it goes below a dollar. He was that convinced that Bitcoin was going to be the thing that he was giving all of his subscribers a personal guarantee to, to buy Bitcoin. And if it ever dropped below a buck, he'd refund them. Wow. So, Dude. <laughs> so I, I, I saw him doing this video about, you know, Bitcoin. And I'm like, what the hell is Bitcoin? Sounds like eagle. That can't work. It's got it's already gotten shut down. I was already using eagle years, years ago. But then I started to look at it and I went on to the Bitcoin talk forums and I started like I made an account like May 2000, 2011 or something. I started just like reading or reading about it. it was like five bucks at the time. And then I'm like, OK, I'm going to instead of buying 
all my putting all this money I was going to put into silver, I'm going to take half and put it in Bitcoin. So I'm going to do half silver, half Bitcoin. And that, thank God I did that because I would, my, the silver was like 40 bucks. I don't even think it's $40. I think it's like in the thirties, isn't it? Or the twenties. Yeah, no, I'm just cheeking my head because I had the exact same conversation with my wife. I was like, all right, I'm going to go half silver, <laughs> half Bitcoin. And it was around that oh, time. That's hilarious. <laughs> okay, okay. And she was like, obviously like silver. Yeah. I'm like, why would you go put this is a random ass thing that we've never even heard of before. <laughs> but I was like, you know, I, I, had the, I had the like perfect foundational knowledge to recognize that Bitcoin was going to be a life, a life changer or a game changer because I was an early technology adopter. I was running a Facebook game dealing with hyperinflation of my digital currency that was centralized. I'd used eGold that had been shut down on me. So I, I saw the, you know, and obviously growing up, everybody that was growing up on the internet saw what happened to Napster and then how BitTorrent was able to survive the uh, regulatory clampdown because it was decentralized. And reading all this stuff with them from the network marketing books about value and investing in real estate and gold and scarce scarcity is value and things like that. I mean, I totally missed the stock market run. I was just, I just didn't give a shit about stocks or bonds or any of this boring financial stuff. I was an entrepreneur and a creator and an artist. And I was like, I want to make movies. I want to like live a, live a life of my choosing. I don't care about stocks. I don't care about all this complex stuff, but it's a scam. So I'm just going to opt out of that system. And I'm going to go for this Bitcoin thing because that seems like money for the people it's decentralized. It can't be printed. It can't be hacked. It's, it can't be shut down. You can pay whatever you want. Like I'm a Mormon, like recovering Mormon at this point, right? I'm not buying drugs on Silk Road or anything like that, but I respect the idea that people can have the, the choice to do whatever they want with their body. And they can buy, like, I love the idea of Silk Road because it allowed people to have these interactions voluntarily with each other and not have any potential for violence. You know, it was to me, it, it felt like well, this is great. Like people can just buy buy their their weed or something from from somebody, get it sent in the mail and not have to meet someone in the dark alleyway where they might get shank, shanked or steal their money or get shot or something like that. It just felt like it was like a perfect technological solution to like libertarian money. And also number was going up, man. So I was like, I got to get more of this shit. This is going to be going to be ten thousand dollars one day. And so that was my, that yeah, that was my kind of intro to Bitcoin. It was like, I got sucked in by the FOMO of the price was going up from five to 10. Silver was going up. I'm like, okay, half, half silver, half Bitcoin, but I'm going to start mining this shit too. Cause I was into games. I had a gaming computer, started mining Bitcoin too in my basement. And uh, yeah, at the time I was just like, just so excited by the technology. And I would, I did not, a, I'm not like a programmer, you know, I can, handle my way around a php like script or something if i got to change a word here or there code a website in html if i if you force me to do it long enough i probably could figure it out but i'm just i was just a regular guy in terms of techno technological knowledge but i had fun learning about bitcoin core and like mining bitcoins and how to like secure your bitcoin and what a private key and a public key was it, it just felt exciting to me that we could be part of this decentralized money revolution. Yeah, likewise. Um, you know, that kind of takes to me to the next question. And by the way, I, I'm cognizant of the fact that, oh, by the way, I think we might already be over our hour that you had booked with me. So if you've got a dip at any point, let me know. Um, I usually try and take them to about 90 minutes. Uh, what, what is your, actually, I usually ask you the hard stop time as well. What is your hard stop uh, right uh, now, Brad? You got 11. 10 or? 11. 11. Okay. Okay, yeah. cool. And uh, okay. In that case, do you mind if we, if we kind of go towards that time? Because, because uh, sure. this is super fascinating um, and I want to make sure I get most of this. Okay. So now let's shift gears into it. Now you've discovered Bitcoin. You're, you know, um, I think a lot of people go into this like hibernation phase, if you will, where they're just <laughs> yeah. like all day, all night, like Bitcoin. Uh, it seems like you'd gone through that. And now you're, I guess, recovering from that coming out, you're mining, you're buying, uh, like, and you're this like artist, entrepreneur, magician, comedian, <laughs> you know, Mormon, uh, computer guy. And, and so now you're, you're, you're trying to like bring it all together and you're like, okay, well, I've, I've seen something like the matrix, like where, 
where 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 everybody um you know is kind of being fooled in some way right it's like people everyone cares about money everyone needs money but nobody can really define mm -hmm. it or even quantify it or figure out what the hell is going on yet there's this like new language of code that makes it very transparent and clear that like you know and maybe not everyone can understand that code but you with your you know whatever skills you have you're able to be like all right this thing's legit what what do you do then like you know as this like guy in this world <laughs> yeah well i i didn't want to be super super public about it because i was nervous and i i you know my upbringing was not like oh i'm this respectful respected like financial expert or something i was like you said i was like a clown like magician actor filmmaker guy what am i what business do i have to talk to anybody about how to invest their money and stuff so i was just kind of like absorbing as much information as i could i started to follow um roger ver and uh, uh trace mayer and jeffrey tucker i think jeffrey tucker was in at that time but like any any kind of like libertarian anarchist evangelist at the time i think max kaiser was even talking about it at that time um and mostly just i was in the mindset of what can i do to make this network stronger like what can i build on this what can i how can i like take all my coders that i have in bangladesh and like make them like focus on building a bitcoin business and like use my marketing knowledge and my evangelist tendencies to like spread the message of bitcoin and it was both the peer-to-peer -peer cash and the digital gold decentralized store of value that got me really excited about it i remember like thinking like wow this is like instant free transactions and it's censorship resistant anybody can run a node and it's like digital gold so i was really hook line and sinker into like both of those narratives not just store of value not just peer-to-peer -peer payments digital cash free instant transactions i was like all of it i love it all it's it's like the perfect money and so i just started to do whatever i could to tell everybody about it every all my friends all my family um, but I wasn't like, like Da Vinci, you know, I didn't make a YouTube channel or a Twitter account and stuff like that. I was just like, how do I, how do I get people I know to participate in this network? Because one of the things that I took from network marketing, which really resonated with me and still does to this day, was the idea that you can not only generate money for yourself, but you can help other people change their life and generate a residual income that that can, that can like help them achieve their goals in some way. So the thing that I didn't like about being an entrepreneur, even though I loved being an entrepreneur and making myself money, I was not helping anybody else make money. I was just helping myself. And I could, you know, sure, use my wealth to like help my family or, you know, donate to a charity or something like that. But I really love the idea of teaching other people how they could generate revenue and how they could have their dreams come true as well and, and make some money. So I, I felt like that was missing with my journey into entrepreneurship, even though it allowed me to achieve some goals and, and live a good life. It wasn't, I wasn't like getting fulfilled in that same way that network marketing was helping me help other people make money. So when I found into, when I got into Bitcoin, it, it reignited that in me again, I felt like, okay, now this is something that not only can I show other people how they can like protect themselves from their deflation of their value of their dollar that they're saving in, but how they can also invest in something that has the potential to give a life-changing return if they just hold on to it. So I got really excited about just telling everybody I knew about it. I was giving Bitcoin away like crazy, like, you know, like everybody does when they become a Bitcoin evangelist, like, hey, get a Bitcoin model. I'll give you a Bitcoin. You know, I'll give you half a Bitcoin. Um, at that point, that was like five bucks, you know, like half a Bitcoin was $5. So I was just giving away Bitcoin to anybody who would download a wallet. And, you know, inspired by watching the Bitcoin faucets, pe people funding the Bitcoin faucets with the same thing. I, I even had a post up on Bitcoin talk that was like, if anybody wants to give me $10,000, 10,000 Bitcoin, I'll gladly take it and, <laughs> and distribute it out to people. <laughs> so I was trying to, I was just trying to like give Bitcoin away. <laughs> that was the thing. And I look back to him, imagine someone actually took me up on that and gave me 10,000 Bitcoin. <laughs> What's that worth today? Oh, 200 million or 2 billion. <laughs> what is that? <laughs>
<laughs> no, no, I agree with you though, by the way. Like I, I do a lot of events and you know, things like that. And I always found that the easiest and fastest and quickest way to like get people to appreciate Bitcoin is just do a transaction. Yeah, just use it. You know, like you could talk about it till you're blue in the face, but just use it. Uh okay. So 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 what then? Like what so I mean, when did your podcast start and what have been what has been kind of the the main, I don't know, like uh the overarching kind of theme of your of your Bitcoin career? Well, you know, I still had my game business at the time too. I was, I was still mm. running the game business. I, I, I got really like, I went really deep down the rabbit hole in 2011 and I got into Bitcoin at 10 bucks and it went to 30 and I thought I was a genius. So I had like, I had bought like um, a $10,000 worth of Bitcoin and um, I put 10,000 into silver and 10,000 into Bitcoin. And then I was like, geez, this thing went up like 2x. So I'm, I got to I gotta take some profit. So I sold half my Bitcoin at 30 bucks thinking I'm a genius, right? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm such a good trader. Like, I'm so good at, at this <laughs> trading thing. And so I sold half my Bitcoin at, at, at $30, took some profits, you know, invested that into like, I started writing a book on Bitcoin and got a ghostwriter to help me with the book and never published it. But I look back and I found it last year. I looked back, it's so bad. I didn't understand Bitcoin very well <laughs> back then. I should publish it as a joke now, just to, just to let people see it. But I was using the, um, um, just, I was just so excited. I just wanted to get the message out. So I was just saying what I thought it was, even though it wasn't that, especially after we saw over the last decade, the, the shift towards decentralization above all else and the fee market develop and things like that. I mean, obviously this is not a competitor to PayPal or Visa. This is a competitor to money itself. So you're going to have to pay on the base layer for fees if you want to use that base layer. And I realized after the fork wars that, yeah, I was on the wrong side of promoting Bitcoin was free and instant transactions. Cause that's what Roger was saying. And I liked his ideas. So I, I had a bit of cognitive dissonance in that 2016-17 um, um, period where I did want to see Bitcoin be cheap and free, but I chose to, not cheap and free, cheap and fast for, for people all over the world because that was one of the things that got me into it. I was excited about the idea that like the billions of unbanked people in the world could, could use this system that could allow them to just with a cell phone or a Raspberry Pi or something like that, cheap computer, use money in a way that they couldn't because they didn't have bank accounts. Like I remember hearing this stat about India in 2005 or four or something like that, where like there's half a billion people or something didn't even have government ID and they were using their BlackBerry ID as their as their ID because the, the cell phones were propagated so much in in India that everybody like that didn't have an, a government ID actually had like gold in a cell phone <laughs> or they were they were like they had this mentality of that so I was like mm. wow this Bitcoin thing can actually help so many people in the world use money and and leap the the gatekeepers and help to promote the idea of liber liberty and freedom so I felt like cheap transactions was like part of that but then, you know, obviously, as you follow the the narratives and the debates and, and stuff, I, I leaned on the side of the small the small block camp. And I started to have hope that we would see Bitcoin scale out in the second layers with Lightning Network and Liquid and all these other second layer networks, because it can it can be that for people still. I mean, we're so early that even though that mission is not here yet, it's not a reality right now that Bitcoin can be used for the person that has $5 in savings and they need to make like 50 cent transactions. I think that it can be eventually. So I felt like Bitcoin, Bitcoin's main um, value was the ability that anybody could have the threat of running a node and that that would keep the idea of decentralization at the core so that there is no way that any government can come in and influence Bitcoin or censor Bitcoin. So I went hard into the like no two X camp. And like, that's when I took a stance when I, when I came out of like my, just, I'm a Bitcoiner, like to my friends and my family and running my business to, I'm going to be like a voice that hopefully can influence this because I started to feel like it was an attack on Bitcoin. 
And after being in Bitcoin for so long, um, I felt like I needed to become a defender of Bitcoin and like evangelize the ideas that are most important to me about Bitcoin, which was decentralization and censorship resistance. And I didn't like to see the early adopters turning against Bitcoin. And uh, I felt like, well, I've been in this thing pretty early. Nobody knows who I am except for my friends and stuff, but I should you know, I owe it to Bitcoin to come out and talk about this in a way that helps promote the idea of censorship resistance, government resistance, and keep it decentralized. So that's kind of the thing, the impetus or whatever that made me go from like focusing on just the making money side of it and the like helping my friends get into Bitcoin to publicly trying to have a, a purpose and a mission and spread a message about Bitcoin. Um, on Twitter and when was Segwit 2x again? I'm trying to remember. Is 20... 2016 was like when the when the Bitcoin Unlimited sort of threat was looming, and um, 2015 I think was like the Hong Kong Agreement, uh, where the the miners kind of agreed that they would do Segwit. But 2016 was when Bitcoin Unlimited started to sort of vie for power. Early 2017 was when Roger started to say things like, I'm going to I'm gonna take Bitcoin.com and pr push it to Bitcoin Unlimited unless I get my way. And then the sort of big block camp kind of, I think they were spamming the, the chain with, with uh, low sat per byte transactions to help exacerbate the fee cr uh, market because um, 2000, November 2017 was when the split happened. August 2017 was when the Segwit 2X kind of was like bubbling up. And and then they had the chance in November 2000, 2017 to actually affect a real chain stall attack on Bitcoin because it was around when Segwit 2X was going to activate and around when Bitcoin Cash Fork happened. Mm -hmm. So the miners were obviously all on the side of mostly on the side of Bitcoin cash. Mm. And a lot of the businesses were on the side of Bitcoin cash at the time it was Segwit 2 X or whatever. But all this culminated in this time when they were spamming, they were spamming the fees. Plus there was legitimate demand for Bitcoin. Like that was the, the crazy run up. So there was a base, a base layer of spammy transactions taking up all the cheap block space. And there was this, mission from Roger, a coordinated attack to get people to kind of like switch to his coin because Bitcoin cash is Bitcoin. And there was a minor kind of like attack where they were switching their hash power over to Bitcoin cash. And so if Segwit 2x had have gone through, I do think that it would have been way more disruptive to Bitcoin than it was because it would have, it was, it was literally like people were the, the hardcore Bitcoiners were going to just nuke Bitcoin. Like, that's the way I felt. It was like, if, if, if Bitcoin loses its decentralized properties, then the price is just going to go so, so low because all the Bitcoiners that were in it for this philosophical reason were just going to like not go along with that narrative. And they were just going to, um, just, you know, not, not accept that narrative that Bitcoin cash or segwit 2 x coin or whatever is bitcoin and they weren't going to go along with the exchanges they weren't going to go along with the miners or and the corporations so i was that the only time in my history of being in bitcoin that i was a bit nervous i wasn't nervous after mount gox collapse happened i lost like majority of my bitcoins in mount gox because again i thought i was a good trader in 2011 because i sold half at 30 and i'm like yeah i'm a good trader i bought a 10 i sold a 30 i'm so good so then in 2013, when the when the bubble heated up again, I'm like, well, I might as well trade. I'm so good at trading and the price is going up again. I, I might as well buy, sell and uh, try to make more Bitcoin. And I had too much of it in Gox. And again, Roger was saying that, oh, everything is fine. I see the, co the coins. I'm here at the headquarters and they're just having banking relationships. Don't worry. You can trust us. So I trusted Roger for some stupid reason, left most of my coins in Gox. And obviously that's that's gone. So. I learned all these lessons about <laughs> risk management during my, my early days as a Bitcoiner. And I was like falling off the wagon, you know, getting eaten by coyotes, <laughs> getting back on the wagon. And then they go over another bump and the coyotes come back and start taking bites out of my, my, uh, my, my hump. 
whatever that word is, rump. So a lot of a lot of people think that if you're in Bitcoin early, then you just did every perfect move you could. And I'm sure you have lots of stories about, <laughs> about people who didn't do the perfect moves and didn't hold. Dude, do I ever? I mean, uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to go into it now, but, you know, uh, yeah, it's it's pretty public knowledge who our main investor at UnoCoin is. And I was not on that side of the Segwit2x. Oh, I think we're, yeah, you're trying to get yourself back into focus. Yeah, you keep going, thing. though. It's okay. It's like a game for people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so there was, there, there, so there's a lot to share there someday. Um and yeah, so I it hits home, hits home. So I'm definitely feeling your your story here. I, in fact, I even had a personal conversation with Roger about you know his kind of thoughts on it and whatnot. And you know that's one of the hardest things is that you know Bitcoin really does get you to start thinking critically and for yourself. Yeah. And anytime you start deviating away from that, you're like, mm, this guy seems like a smart guy. I'll just you know, I'll just go to sleep tonight doing whatever he said, because he sounds like a smart guy. Um, yeah, it's better to kind of like validate and try and I mean, whatever, whatever resources you have or ability you have just to kind of, you know, look it up because all this stuff's open source and it's all, you know, out there. And and uh, anyway, so, OK, um, so where are we now? So we're with you in terms of your story. Right. So you, 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 you realize now that, you know, you're calling, right. You're like, all right, like I actually have been screwed enough in this space and have enough life experiences to stand up against some of the, maybe the, the Goliaths uh, in this space and actually speak up and, and try yeah. and, you know, be that, that guy, like the, the guy that you were growing up, right. Like trying to defend Bitcoin now because it, it represented something. So, so I'm curious. So, so now, I mean, what do you consider yourself now? Are you like a, a Bitcoin podcaster or like a, I mean, like an entertainer, an artist, all the above, none of the above? <laughs> that's, a, that's a struggle that I've had like for my whole adult life because I've, I'm kind of like a polymath in a way. Like I'll keep, I'll, I'll kind of like climb up a ladder in a certain area and then I'll just get distracted by this shiny thing over here and then I'll go climb that ladder and then I'll kind of like network with people, develop a bit of a reputation develop some success and then like oh wait a second look there's there's this new shiny thing over here and i'll go over there and start climbing up the ladder and then you know i never climb far enough that i'm gonna reach the ultimate pinnacle level of success and mastery in this one uh niche or area or whatever and i i kind of struggled with that a lot because when you know that dreaded question that you get when you're at a conference or something so what do you do and you're like uh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> how do I how do I say what do I do here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I was like I was all over the place. Like, but, I was but, but speaking so of shiny things, when around this time period, I'm really interested in hearing a little bit about your viewpoint of the emergence of Ethereum and you know and kind of that that yeah. I mean, we talked a little bit about within Bitcoin and the kind of the forks and whatnot, but. You know, a lot of people see Ethereum as a as a threat. Some people see Ethereum as you know the the savior and like the world computer and and uh, and so yeah. So I'm really curious, like what what are, what's your relationship been with that camp? Well, so I wish I had just held on my Bitcoin, right? Like if I had just held on my Bitcoin, I wouldn't need to pay attention to any of that stuff, and I wouldn't need to try to do anything to make any money anymore in my life. I could just focus on on doing whatever the hell I want. Cause if you had like a thousand Bitcoin and you held it all the way through to now, what's that like 40 million or something or 20 Probably million more than most countries, whatever. <laughs> yeah, or something. Yeah, it, I don't know. It's a lot. Right. And obviously if you had just held, you wouldn't have had to pay attention to any of this stuff. It wouldn't really matter. And you could just do what you wanted. Um, because I lost most of my Bitcoin in 2013 or 14, you know, whenever Gox went under, I was like, okay, I need to get my stack back. I need to get back some Bitcoin. I ha- I still had some that I had saved. Thankfully, I didn't have it all in Gox. And I had like this this cold storage amount of Bitcoin that I, I, it wasn't meaningful enough at the time because the price wasn't high enough. And I was still doing my business. I ended up raising like in 2013, I raised like 1.5 million for just on a, on a, on a random shot from some Chinese investors for my game company. Cause I was building apps too. Like I still have my game company. The revenue at this point had gone pretty much to zero. I mean, the revenue was still up, but the, the profits, cause we had contractors and expenses and things like that. So I wasn't making any profits anymore with my game company. It was just more like, I wanted to keep it alive because these players loved it so much. 
and it was like generating an income for like, I was paying uh, three or four people to, to work on this thing. And it was like their life, you know, that was what was paying them to live. So I'm like, I don't want to shut it down because even though I prefer to be in Bitcoin, it's so volatile. Like I wasted all this time and energy trying to build these Bitcoin businesses in 2011 and 12. And the price went down from, from like $30 at the high to like two bucks. And I ended up owing out a bunch of money because I was pricing things in dollars and Bitcoin was fluctuating too much. So I was like, I just got to like hold Bitcoin, evangelize Bitcoin. I got to give up all these ideas I have about like paying people in Bitcoin and doing these Bitcoin businesses because it's too volatile. And sure, I think it's going to go to $10,000 one day, but it's not going to be an easy road to get there. And I'm going to hold and I'm going to like, I'm going to just try to get as much Bitcoin as I can relative to my net worth. And, and just continue living my life of, as an entrepreneur and trying to be a filmmaker and all this stuff. But while still talking about Bitcoin, writing about it, you know, always writing about it on Facebook and my blogs and stuff like that. Um, occasionally doing vlog updates to people like, oh, by the way, Bitcoin's at 200 bucks. You should get some, like, you know, trying to, trying to encourage all my network in these other entrepreneurial ventures who thought I was crazy. They all thought I was nuts when I'm talking about Bitcoin as potentially competing with gold in 2013 at these entrepreneur conferences and stuff. It, they thought I was crazy, most of them. But in 2014, when Gox went under, I realized like, okay, I had this game company. I have like 20 employees at the time. I've got like 200 apps that we had built over one year and pushed in the app store. I had two, two games went to the top 10 in the iOS uh, free charts. So we had a lot of, a lot of players, but I made the mistake of trying to like move fast and break things. And I, I, I lost a bunch of money trying to do that, like perfect startup thing where you invest too much time and you, you have that mentality of if you build it, they will come. So you spend all your money building the perfect product and then you launch it and it's like, nobody's there to play it. So I wasted a bunch of money in 2013 doing that. And then in 2000, the end of 2013, while Bitcoin started to go nuts, I also raised money from this investor and then spent the year building out this big team. Um, we, we were like headquartered in an abandoned women's gym with like a hot tub and eight showers. And it was an awesome experience. I basically lived like a little mini Google studio and built a hundred, 200 apps. A couple of them were very successful, but I ended up just moving too fast and not making the right moves. And I, I was trying to build some Bitcoin games as well because it started to get the bug back. I'm like, okay, this thing is going 800, 900, 1,000. All right, I got I to gotta pay more attention to Bitcoin, mix my games in with my Bitcoin knowledge and my, my Bitcoin passion. And then obviously, Mt. Gox happened. At one point, I'm like making more money just by myself buying and selling Bitcoin on Mt. Gox than my entire company with 20 employees is making. So I'm like, I got to refocus my efforts here. I was deep into like... A, a, um, a stressful period of my life when I felt like I had taken this money from these investors. I needed to make this business work, but Bitcoin is my passion and it means something where this is just making money and it's not even making enough money to pay for itself. And there's just all these complicated things happening with the game industry at the time because it was just so saturated. So I made some mistakes in management um, as, a, as a CEO and a manager of people. I I wasn't, I was trying to do things in a way that was like giving people mastery, autonomy, purpose, you know, the, the Dan Pink, like human motivating uh, thing. So, so we would have like an hour a day where people could just exercise and work out together. We do P90X at the gym together and like people could stay home and work from home if they wanted. And I just gave people a lot of freedom to like develop mastery and, and have autonomy. And then I would do that too. I would like, try to do some Bitcoin stuff. So the company ended up failing because I was not, I was, I was making these moves that I don't know why I was doing it. I was doing it because I thought it was the right thing to do, but it turned out that it was generating a lot of money, but not enough. And we ended up just burning through most of our cash flow, And we got a delay of payment for the final tranche of money that the investors had promised, which totally screwed up the whole strategy because it was like an, a, an acquisition strategy too. I had a couple of studios I was going to acquire. So it was around this time. I'm super stressed out. Um, Mount Gox goes under, like there starts to be rumbles. I'm like, I'm starting to get stress pains and my, my tongue is going numb. Half my face is going numb. I'm feeling so much responsibility to all these employees I have. 
and I'm, I'm dreading having to let them go, but the, the revenue starting to drop, you know, it's a very fickle business, the game business, because you can have a game that goes top 10 charts. And then the next weekend, it's just like, nobody's playing it anymore. So we had succeeded in this area, but we just didn't have the formula, right? It was not, I couldn't recreate the original Facebook game success that I had in a way that was lasting. So it was a tough thing for me as like a leader to realize like, I'm, maybe I shouldn't be managing people right now. And I'm probably not going to make back the money that these investors put in. Thankfully, the investors were like billionaires and they didn't give a shit about losing a million dollars. And like, they would come visit and they'd be like, um, oh, it's okay if you don't make the money back. <laughs> and But I'm like, but my word, I gave you my word. I said I was going to do this. So it was a real stressful time for me to have the business fail plus have my, lose my Bitcoin stash that I was like banking on for retirement to lose that in Gox. So that all puts, to get you into the mindset of where I'm at, I'm like, I need to start making some more Bitcoin. I got to deal with this business. I got to lay off all of my employees and just keep a bare bones staff going to manage the games we have. Try to dig us out of the hole in a way that's not burning our, our, our cash flow. Like, so that our runways extended for a couple of years rather than like a couple of months because we were burning like 80K a month in staff and stuff. And it was only making like maybe 50K a month or something. So <clears throat> we had a really big burn rate. And even the gym it was such a sweet deal. It was like a 20,000 square foot gym with a hot tub and a steam room and eight showers. I was only paying like $4,000 a month for the gym. It was like the ultimate deal for an office space. And I worked out a really crazy deal with them, but even with all that, I just had some, I just made some mistakes in my management and I decided I had to bite the bullet. So the stress of losing that Bitcoin plus having to shut the business down, plus being responsible to these investors was so much that I just had to take a break from, from like everything. So about a year, I was going to invest in the Ethereum ICO. Actually, I, you know, I knew Vitalik and I was like hanging out in these Skype rooms with all these crypto investors and stuff. And I was like, sure, whatever, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I need to get more Bitcoin. So whatever it takes to get me more Bitcoin, if that's investing in ICOs or altcoins or whatever, I don't care. I'm going to invest in whatever just to get more Bitcoin because mining was too hard for me. So I was like, at the time, you know, you need ASICs and stuff. So I don't want to have to manage a mine. So the easiest way to do it is just to either buy it or to use altcoins as leverage to get in on the FOMO and make more Bitcoin. So that was my mentality at the time, 2013, 14. Um, so I took about a year off and I ended up kind of like recovering from that. I had to do like lorazepam and go, go on lorazepam, like Ativan and stuff and de-stress, disconnect, you know, spend more time with my family. Um, just start just to play some video games, you know, get, distract myself from everything while I was scaling the company down and not be like working 80 hour days or <laughs> sorry, weeks doing like, uh, you know, all my game business in the day and all my Bitcoin stuff at night. And it was just, I lost like 20 pounds from stress and like just from going down the rabbit hole again, <laughs> trying to make more Bitcoin. So I'd ended up missing the Ethereum ICO because I took a break during that time. I didn't really care because by the time I came back, it was like 2015. Right. And I had invested in like getting some more Bitcoin through mining. Again, I joined like a mining um, SPV or whatever, where we were going to mine um, Litecoin, I think it was and convert it to Bitcoin. And because at the time there was these script ASIC machines that were coming out and we placed like a big order from grid seed and, my script like script asic machines were kind of new so we were we were the first to like set up a big mine to to mine a bunch of litecoin and convert it all to bitcoin to try to get more bitcoin so thankfully with that effort i had i had managed to get back enough bitcoin i didn't ever like from the mining operation get back my stash that i'd lost in gox but i got enough back that i was like back in the game and that when this went to ten thousand dollars like i believed it would and at the time it was like 400 then I would have enough because I was always thinking in terms of my Bitcoin is one day going to be worth 10,000. So even though I only have X amount, it's nothing right now, but that's going to be a significant amount when, when it goes to 10,000 in 10 years or whatever I was thinking. So 2015 comes along and all these altcoins are going crazy. It's like Poloniex and Cripsy and all this. And 
all my early Bitcoin friends that I had made like privately networked with are all trading these altcoins and they're all trying to stack more Bitcoin by trading the, all these shit coins. And I'm like, whatever, like whatever it takes to get me back to my stack that I lost in Gox, I'll just do whatever I need, invest in some altcoins. So my mentality at the time was like what most people probably are thinking right now. The, like 90% of the people that are going to come into crypto are going to, they're not going to come straight in through the Bitcoin maximalist path. They're going to come in, they're going to Google Bitcoin. They're going to get scammed by a bunch of Ponzi schemes and pyramid scams and uh, shitcoin pump and dumps, just like I did when I first Googled, how do I make money online? Remember people American Gladiator? American that show American Gladiator where they have like a tiny, yes, little, you know, yes. All these massive like <laughs> yeah. dudes. it's kind of like that, right? For a new person coming in. Oh yeah. <laughs> And the funny thing is those roided out dudes are actually the Bitcoin maximalists and they're the heroes and they're trying to save you from the pits from the shitcoin <laughs> casino. But, but it appears to people that are coming in like, who are these Bitcoin maximalist guys that are saying I can't own an altcoin and that this is a scam and that's a scam. It really turns people off, unfortunately. And that's something I struggled with too, because at my core, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. But even when I go deeper than that, I'm a value maximalist. Bitcoin represents to me value and freedom. So it's not Bitcoin. It's the idea of what Bitcoin is and that, and that Bitcoin is the only real chance I think we have at usurping power from the centralizers and the censorship peddlers and like the digital bank currencies and all this stuff. I think Bitcoin is the only truly decentralized coin. And it's the only chance we have to provide as much liberty and freedom to people all over the world. So if it was something else, I would probably get over my cognitive dissonance and back that thing. But because nothing else meets those criteria to me, I look at all these stable coins and DeFi projects and Ethereum as a Trojan, a Trojan horse for tyranny. And it, it pisses me off because these, like what they're doing is recreating all the toxic quant crap that got us into the problems in the first place on a blockchain. So that's why I get a little bit frustrated and pissed off because Ethereum is not fairly distributed. Ethereum did an ICO and Ethereum is got a bad Gini coefficient. Like Bitcoin's Gini coefficient is not good either. And for people who don't know what that is, it's just the, 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 the distribution of wealth. Like how fair is your currency distributed? Bitcoin has the best Gini coefficient of cryptocurrency and it's trending in the right direction. It's going down every year. Ethereum and all these other altcoins are going up every year and up is bad. So, you know, you don't want the wealth to be concentrated more and more into the hands of whales. You want this, you, you want the currency to be more fairly distributed. The US dollar is getting worse and worse every year. So Bitcoin is really the only currency that's getting better every year compared to any altcoin or any fiat currency, concentration of wealth is going more and more to the, to the elites and, and the, the insiders. But in Bitcoin, it's going more and more like widely distributed as, as, the mass, it is, as these mass adoption cycles happen, early, early people sell their coins. You know, and you can see that in the chart of the ETH2 thing that just happened where they were at like 20% for this longest time. And then all of a sudden in like two days, five or six big whales put all their ETH in the locked up in the staking contract and then activated the ETH2 sort of like staking thing. Like it, it was uh, somebody did an analysis of it and it showed that like most of those coins were from the early Genesis addresses. It was like a, like a, a group of whale uh, addresses that activated the, the staking thing. So while I'm like totally represent, totally understand somebody that's going to want to, um, trade altcoins and come in and see this like progressive community of like inclusive um, d democratic leaning young um, coders that are building the, the future of finance on Ethereum and pushing this message of caring about things. And we're doing this for the poor people all over the world and democratizing finance. And they got all this message of hope and it's, it's not, when you actually look at the majority of the activity that happens on Ethereum and DeFi, it's boiler room, insider pump and dumps, VC backed printing of tokens that really have no fundamental value, like governance tokens that they'll then sell on Coinbase because it's all Silicon Valley insiders backing these things, then 
milking the the retail traders and the crypto traders by dumping it all. I mean, there's some interesting stuff for sure being built on DeFi, but most of it, the significant majority of it, to me, it feels like a crypto casino um, and it's all mostly centralized. There's a few decentralized properties. Ethereum is trying to be more decentralized, but it's not. I mean, it's it's more centralized. It's 100% more centralized than Bitcoin. And I don't, I don't think that we've seen a government attack yet. I think like Bitcoin saw a government attack in 2013 when they went after Silk Road and Charlie Schramm and, and the Bitcoin businesses. Um, Katie Hahn, who, who was at the time the DA for New York, I think it was district attorney or a, a prosecutor, she, she said that her bosses in a Kyle Bast interview that Real Vision did last year, she said that her bosses, like the DA, tasked her with shutting down Bitcoin. They wanted her to, to go after Bitcoin. And she quickly discovered that you couldn't shut down Bitcoin. So instead, they went after the, the people building on Bitcoin. So that was like the first political attack that we saw on Bitcoin, where they actually took people building on Bitcoin and trying to promote freedom and liberty and like arrested them and threw the book at them. And now Katie Hahn is the head of Andreessen Horowitz crypto division. So that shows you like the mentality of the people investing in Ethereum and stable coins. Stable coins are someone else's dollars. It's not providing you with self-sovereignty. Sure, it's convenient to use a stable coin and it's cheap and it's not even cheap anymore. It's like, you know, $5 sometimes to send a stable coin transaction. So that narrative's gone. But I look at the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum as Bitcoin is like competing with gold, competing with money. It's, it's a, a core decentralized properties are worth fighting for. And there's Bitcoiners who will die for Bitcoin. There's Bitcoiners who are defenders of freedom and liberty. And with Ethereum, it's more like a series E tech stock where they're taking some blockchain stuff and they're, they're, they're experimenting with value, but it's more like AWS meets, I don't know, some, some sort of decentralized cryptocurrency, of course, but it's not decentralization at the core. And if, if, if the world adopts something like a stable coin, What's going to happen when the next government attack comes, when they're not just going to go after the Bitcoin businesses, but they're going to go to the companies that run these cryptocurrencies and these DeFi protocols, and they're going to say, you need to respect our rules. You need to ban the transactions from uh, this OFAC list. Here's the addresses that you can't process. You can't process anything from Tornado Cash. You have to ban the Uniswap. Um, you have to fork Ethereum to ban Uniswap protocol. Like That could happen. And I feel like there's not enough of a mentality of activism and um, the cypherpunk roots of Bitcoin where they will fight against that. I feel like if the government does attack um, and try to come in and, and, and control what happens on these networks, if Ethereum is the winner, it's going to be they're going to have their way. They're not going to like risk Vitalik and Joe Lube and going to jail for life because they won't block Tornado Cash. You know, they'll I feel like they would fork it and respect and comply. And I feel like Bitcoin is the only chance that we have of standing up against oppression and, and governments that would want to try to take over. So, Brad, this has been an interesting two hours. Um, I want to be mindful of your your time. Uh, I would be down to do this again anytime <laughs> as like a follow up. Uh, I, to be honest, didn't even really get through all my questions just because the story has been so fascinating. Um, but I just wanted to give you a chance before I let you go. Where do people learn more about you? Where do people find out more? I know we've got a minute left here, but how, if people want to keep going with the, the Brad train. Yeah, you can you can follow my YouTube channel, Mill Sideshow Productions, where I do magic shows every friday night and clown shows on tuesday i'm just kidding I'm just hey, hey, hey. I, don't do I don't do that uh magic internet money is the name of my podcast you can find it on uh, wherever you get podcasts hopefully and uh you can follow me on twitter at brad mills can and um yeah hopefully i'll have would love to have another conversation with you yeah, Brad, uh, I'm down, man. I know this one is more about like your story and stuff. So a little walk down memory lane, but but I'm down to jam on anything. I think, man, you, we touched on so many things, um, principles and morals and you know what I mean? And just like getting new people into the space and making sure that they don't land on some yeah, of the lines that we did. I, I'd love to go down these rabbit holes. And uh, well, next episode, yeah, so next episode, that, you come on Magic yeah. Internet Money and I'll done. hear your story. Done. 
Done. All right. Done. Done. Sounds good, man. Okay, so with that, we'll bring one to bring it to a close, and I 